uh, this series that we're in, though, Family Matters, this is part one, and so if you're a note taker, because you love Jesus, uh, tonight's, uh, or today's message is suit up, suit up. Um, and here's the kind of layout for the message and really the series. Uh, like those TV shows, those family sitcoms, we want to come into your home and leave some information. And so uh, what Micah explained is that those family sitcoms would present a problem and within 30 minutes solve it. Now, if you're like me, if there's a problem, it takes me a lot longer than 30 minutes to solve it unless it's on YouTube, right? I I just don't have it in me. There's a problem at work. It's going to take a while, but those TV shows could do it. I mean, think of like the actual TV show Family Matters. Do the Urkel. Do the Urkel. You know, like Stevie Stevie Urkel, man, he he laid down some wisdom for me growing up. Or um, a home improvement, Tim Allen. You know, I mean, he... He, he told me what not to do with tools, but what to do with family, you know. And so some of those TV shows would leave some wisdom, would leave something helpful. And now as I watch TV in what is my favorite room in the house, the living room, that's why I have this setup right here. This is actually Lennox's chair at Paw Paw and Mimi's house. Yeah. All right, so he might run up here if he sees it. Is this your chair, buddy? That's your chair, isn't it? Yeah, he's staring at it like, what are you doing with my chair, dude? <laughs> so this is my favorite setup in the house. And how many of you know that our students are always learning. There are so many people teaching our students, and some of them you didn't sign off on. Like the school teaches them, and that's great, but some of their friends are teaching them. Hopefully they chose wisely. Uh, The internet is teaching them, but everything on the internet's true, right? Ah, yeah. Social media is teaching them. Music's teaching them. And so when I think about the living room, I'm trying to think about what teaching's going on there, too, and so I'm thinking of TV shows. Now, I love to be, be in the living room, binge-watching Netflix. That's my happy place. That's going to be in my mansion in heaven, I, I, I believe, right? That's going to be it. But right now, you've got TV shows like Keeping Up with the Kardashians, and that's what I'm learning, how to have eyebrows that are snatch. Did I get it right, babe? Versus teaching me the, the, the language. So when I watched Kim on the Kardashians, I, I'm, I'm learning how to have snatch eyebrows. I'm trying to use that word and learn how to use it because I'm a youth pastor. We have to do these things. There's a tutorial you have to go through. Every week it changes. And I used it wrong the other day. I said, she came out the, um, from getting ready. I said, babe, you look snatchable. She said, Josh, that, that's not right. That's what kidnappers say. It's just snatch. I said, oh, oh, oh. You snatch then. Like, girl, I'm going to snatch you up, you know. All right. So, so I'm, I'm learning that from the Kardashians, and that's not going to help me in my week, so, so, but I'm learning that from TV. And now I think of other shows like Tomorrow Night, when Hannah tries to resolve this issue with Luke P and all that he's doing to her. Now, for all the husbands who don't know those names, you're a real man. For all the husbands that do know those names and know that it's from The Bachelorette, you are committed to your marriage, sir, and I applaud you for that. Good luck tomorrow. I don't think there's a game on during that time, so you suffer through, and I'll be right there with you. But these are the kind of things we're learning from TV, how to not date on a budget, right, from the Bachelorette. It's like, come on, that, you're shooting me in the foot. But that's what we're learning. And so I want to take back over the living room today. And so today's message is for parents and children. And that this environment, when we're sitting together, and we're in the living room, we need to grow together. And so, that being said, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. I'll set it up as you try to find it. Um, If you get to Leviticus, you still have a long way to go, okay? Uh, But Ephesians chapter 6, and here's what Paul's doing. He's in Rome, he's in prison, and he's writing a letter to Ephesus. And he's saying, hey, you guys, in the first three chapters, he says, here's what Jesus did for you and for me, and here's what that means for us. And then in chapters 4 through 6, he applies it and says, okay, because of what he did, here's how we should live. Here's what we should do. And if I were to summarize chapters 4 through 6 in one word, it would be unity. So the whole concept of that is is unity, that we should be together. And that's why, wives, bear with me for a second. Your husband probably tried to use this against you, but in chapter 5 he says, wives, submit and you're not so sharp theologian of a husband, tried to use that against you, right? And he took it out of context. But here's what you can say, uh, wives, if your husband tries to say that. 
look at him and say, honey, what is that verse again? Oh, Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 5 where he says, wives, he's right there. Paul won't even talk to you, babe, so you don't even need to just keep going past that. <laughs> he was not talking to you. Go get your part right, right? <laughs> now, fellas, I, I, I'm sorry that I had to break that out on you, but uh, it, Paul did it first because, look, he told wives what to do in three verses. When you get to our part, it's eight verses long. <laughs> Paul already knew, so he said, all right, what do I need to tell guys while I'm in prison? 1A, all right, fellas, right? And so he has to break it down, and it takes eight verses for us to just get that simple instruction. But, I, you know, thank God for you too. But it takes all of that to say we need unity. So he says, wives, here's what you need to do. Husbands, here's what you need to do. Children, obey your parents. And so you're thinking, if they would just listen, right? And then he goes on and says, fathers, don't, don't exasperate your children. Don't, don't furiate them. Don't, don't get them mad. Teach them scripture. Teach them God's word. Amen. And so that's today's big takeaway. But we can jump in now. It's going to be verse uh, 13, but 12 says this. I want to summarize it because it's kind of long. But Paul just begins by saying, hey, we're going to be at war, but I need you to know that we're not at war with people. So two weeks ago when we began this series with our squad, we said that it's not people we're arguing with. It's, it's actually everything behind them. It's their past experiences. Right. So when you disagree with someone, you're not really disagreeing with them, although all of your problems, you put a name on it. You call that problem your boss. You call that problem your ex-friend. You call that problem one of your used-to-be followers. Maybe you call that problem your spouse. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get into all that. But you want to put a label on it, and Paul's saying, no, it's not people that you're actually fighting against. It's all of their past experiences that have culminated into their beliefs and their opinions that you're disagreeing with. And so when you argue, I need you to know this, we tell this to our squad all the time, you are one decision away from agreeing with the person you disagree with most. That's good. Because if you grew up in their home, you'd have their same opinion. If you grew up in that part of the country, you'd have that same viewpoint. If you had that job or your parents had that job growing up, then you would view the things the same way right. and in fact agree with them. Right. So I'm not arguing with the person sitting across from me, I'm arguing with everything that's behind them. So let me talk to that. And um, so I know it sounds spiritual, and we're talking about the armor of God coming up, and so this may, like, throw you for a loop. So if you're, like, new to Christianity, you're checking out Christianity, you don't even believe in God, maybe you're here. That's cool. We're glad that you're here. Let me pose one question to you. If you're a non-believer or not quite there yet or a doubter, let me pose one question to you that you can struggle with or, like, try to figure out throughout the rest of this talk, and we'll move on in a different direction. But here's your question if you're a doubter. Where do evil thoughts come from? All right, you handle that. We're going to keep moving on, all right? You can follow up with me after this talk. So now let's pick up with verse 13. Here's what Paul writes. He says, okay, therefore put on the full armor of God, meaning that it's all you need, right? You need piece by piece, but this is all you need. It's not that I left anything out. If you put all of this on, you're good to go. So therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day, when the day, not if the day, I know it's going to come, so when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. Verse 14, stand firm then. He said stand three times within like one sentence. So in the Bible, if it's repeated, it's important. So keep that in mind. So stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place. That rhymes, I didn't realize that before, but Paul was like a rap star apparently. And with your feet, like all rap stars, you go to jail and then you write lyrics, right? So Paul, OG. So with that around your waist and the righteousness in place, whoop, whoop. verse 15, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes with Jordans or Ultra Boosts, that's my translation, but the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. And verse 16, in, the, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. All right. So our squad has already been through this series. Okay, they've already done verses uh, 12 through 16. So if you have any questions, you can go see them. All right, follow up with them. But I'll try to catch you up very quickly. All right, so Paul is talking about this armor. And he's saying, here's what, what we need. If we're going to go to war, here's what we need to put on. Here's what we need to like, make sure that we 
are covering ourselves with. And the first thing he says is the belt of truth, okay? So, so the belt. Now, the belt supports everything, right? It holds it together. So the belt is going to support what I have on, thank God. But the skinny jeans are here, so even if I didn't have a belt, we're still good to go. But the belt of truth is going to support everything that I do. So we told our students that when it comes to you making a decision, make sure you're deciding using truth. Don't be on a happiness quest. Because the happiness will get you happiness temporarily and then turn to regret long term. So you don't want a happiness quest. You want a truth quest. So you need people in your squad, your family, and your circle of friends who will direct you to truth, not happiness. But how many of you know the unique sound of rawhide going through belt loops at a very fast pace? Yeah. I grew up with a father that believed in the belt of truth. And he used it judiciously and consistently. And I'm sad to say that constantly, especially Sundays, but hey, here, here I am now. But there's one particular time where we were out shopping and it was not my time to buy anything because guess what? I did not make any money. But I was a young little dude and uh, we, were, we were walking around and I saw something I wanted. I wanted a bow and arrow set. That's right. It had the little stoppers on the arrows so that you could shoot it at a TV screen that Dad would use the Windex all the time, and it would stick, right? And so I wanted that bow and arrow set, and Mom and Dad said, no, don't ask for it again. Don't ask for it again, and they, they repeated that. Well, my aunt was with us, and she had the heart of God and said, I need to anoint this young man with those bows and arrows. So she bought it for me. I was excited. My parents were not. And so when we got home, my dad said, I need to direct my son to not do that again. And then it became a race. The sound of the belt loops as the belt was coming out, and I, on the other side of the room, trying to untie my bow and arrow to take up my arms in defense about with the battle that was coming against me in the Spirit of God. So I'm trying to take up all the ties of this bow and arrow, and I won. So I got the bow, and I got the arrow, and I pulled back. And ain't none of us Carter's tall, so I missed him high each time. And I'm shooting over the top of him. My dad's quick, and he's bouncing left and right with that belt in hand. Pop, pop, right? And then the worst thing that could happen happened. I ran out of arrows. My dad did not run out of truth. And so in that moment, I grew spiritually mature. Brought to you by leather and rawhide. And he informed me that we do not need to ask our aunt to buy us anything else. But it was the belt of truth. Now, the belt goes around my waist. And what that means is any direction I move, I'm walking in truth. If I go backwards, I can still have truth. Forwards, I can still have truth. Because some things will knock me back. Some things will knock me to the side. But I can take that step in truth of who God is. And so the next thing, so now imagine that maybe you're in the military. And I'm not in the military. I watch a lot of military movies and shows, so that kind of, I guess, brings me into the loop very little. But if I'm, if I'm checking in, we're about to go to war, I get to the station and Paul says, all right, here's your belt. So I put my belt on, and then next he says, okay, your breastplate. And so the breastplate is intended to go across my chest and protect vital organs, including my heart. So what we told our students the other night is that I need to protect my heart, and my heart is going to direct my steps, because what I want, what I'm intrigued by, I will take a step toward. Right. So I need to protect that to ensure that what I'm walking toward is something that I want to walk toward and be with, be in, right? And so what happens often is that we do this crazy thing to where we attend church on Sunday, right? But then on Monday we meet Bay, and her eyebrows were snatchable. <laughs> I meant that that way. She drew them on, so you could snatch you know, I'm just kidding. But you meet someone, and all of a sudden it becomes this thing where I'm going to take my breastplate off, and I'm just going to carry it beside me. Because, God, I don't need you in this relationship, you know. Uh, I'm going to try to get these digits all by myself, okay? And then whatever happens on this date happens in my name, not your name, because you don't, you don't even watch this. Jesus, Jesus looked the other way. This is PG to the 13, okay? Right? And so all of a sudden it's like I'm going into war, but I'm taking off my protective clothing, what sense does it make to go into a battle and take off my protective gear and walk beside me and say, oh, I still got it, but we do that. We walk into our job and say, God, I don't want you on my job. I got this. Amen. 
and now all of a sudden I'm on a happiness quest. And so we finalized, we put both of those pieces of, of armor together and said, students, if you're going to be directed by your heart, make sure it's directing you toward truth. Make sure that the breastplate is in place to protect your heart and it's taking you to truth and put the whole thing together, clank, clank, lock down, okay? So now let's go to the next piece. He says, now you need to have your feet on fleek, right? You, ha you have to have the feet situation ready to go. Now, if we're going to war, there's anxiety, there's concern, there's worry, and there should be. So how is it that I can have peace in the, in the middle of my worry and my concern? Well, notice that Paul didn't say your peace. Not the peace that you can make up, not the way that you can try to justify and rationalize that, oh, this is going to work out because I can do this and I can do that. No, this is a peace that's beyond you. Because what's greater than me isn't greater than my God. And so I can be in peace while I stand in the middle of pain, of suffering, and a struggle, and a battle. And when I have it strapped on my feet, my feet are on a foundation to where I can stand. Not run away, not cower away, I can stand. And so he said, make sure that you're ready for this. Taking it further, he said, now let me give you a shield. And I used to think that a shield was something that I would hide behind. Like, oh no, I'm being overcome right now by, by everything that's working against me. And so I thought, or I think of a shield as this, not even a weapon, but something that I'm just going to hide behind, I'm afraid behind here, I hope nothing bad happens. But that's not the way Paul described it. Paul said that when I'm using my shield of faith, the arrows will come and they will be extinguished by my faith. Amen. So all of a sudden I'm realizing that with, with everything I have on, if I put it together with my belt, my breastplate, and my shoes, that this isn't for me to cower behind, it's for me to catch what the enemy's throwing against me and still advance forward. And so now I'm standing, but I'm progressing in that battle that's coming from a distance, I'm bringing the fight to you. Amen. You're trying to be Josh throwing arrows at dad, but you need to realize that that battle of, with the belt of truth is coming to you, right? And so that's what Paul's saying, that you're not hiding behind this, this is your faith. That you're gonna catch what's coming against you, that attack, is going to become a close-up battle. Right. Well, Josh, how do you know it's close? Because of verse 17. Verse 17 says you need a helmet of salvation. Now, Paul, if you're going to use a helmet of salvation, isn't there another body part or, like, metaphor you could use? Because, like, the salvation of your heart, like, Jesus, Jesus washed my heart. He changed me from the inside out. That makes more sense. But Paul says, no, it's your helmet. Because what you have to realize is that we internalize everything. True. So when an attack comes, I'm wondering what I did. For this to happen. When an attack comes from a distance, I'm thinking, how did I not see this coming? Amen. Or if I even see it, I'm still internalizing and saying, how did I allow this to happen? Right. What you have to know, if you're also a skeptic or a, a doubter, so if you're still trying to rationalize my last question, let me give you this metaphor. When you doubt God or you blame God for things that happen against you, think of this. It's kind of like you're driving in a car and there's another car driving on the wrong side of the road and you're about to collide with it. And so you look to your father in the driver's seat and say, Dad, that car's coming. And your dad flashes his lights, and he honks his horn, and yet that car still keeps coming, and you collide. And after the wreckage, you look to your dad and say, why did you let that car hit us? And God's saying, I tried to warn it. I tried to stop it, and it kept coming. You're blaming God for something that he did not intend to happen to you. But all those past experiences from someone else collided with your world, and now we have a battle. So now back to this. So we have this helmet of salvation because I need to realize that I have to protect my mind. Amen. Here's the battlefield of the devil. He wants to get right in here and make you second guess your truth, make it second guess your faith, make you second guess your peace to where you have this constant battle going on that you can't advance forward. There is no peace. There's only anxiety and angst. And so I'm going to cower behind and fall back and retreat. And this last thing, this last thing, it, it, it messed with me. I was like, Paul, I don't agree with this at all. So I'm at the table. I get my belt. All right, I got my truth. I got my peace. I'm getting my faith. I got my salvation. And then Paul says, and here is your weapon. I'm thinking, all right, let, what do we got? The big one. Give me the big one. And it's a sword. Uh, time out, Paul. Uh, see, the, the way I work is um, I want to be away from the battle but still help out. So if it's modern day, how about this? How about, how about you go kick in the door, Paul? I'll be the sniper on the roof a very long way away, but I got your back. All right, let, let me do that. And, and better yet, let me be the guy controlling the drone, all right? 
I'll be in another country, but I got you. That's me. That's my ministry. That's what I, I want to do. But Paul says, no, 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 here's a sword. And I thought, arrows at a distance against a sword, I don't like. Because the arrows, I can fire away, but the sword, I've got to be up close. And it reminded me that you can expect an up-close battle. I can expect a battle that's personal. I can expect a battle to where I probably know the name of what's coming against me. I can expect a battle uh, against me because the battle is actually within me. And so it's a sword, but it's not just a weapon that's lethal. It's a weapon that encourages and grows. It's the Word of God. And so now I see, that, okay, Paul, you've given me this up-close weapon. Why do I have to be so up-close for this? And I think it's because from this viewpoint of what Dad's doing in this chair, it's a close battle. Amen. And so he's got to witness what I'm going through so he won't have to do it. In other words, as a father, I've got to fight so that he won't have to. I've got to take up the battle so that I can be an example for what he will not have to experience. And so what it looks like is this. I need to battle all of the things working against me. If it's conflicts with people who are ranking higher than me, I have a problem with authority. If that's you, then I need to battle that now so that he won't have to and he will know respect when there's authority. I need to battle conflict with a spouse so that I know how to handle those disagreements and those arguments or those loud conversations away from him so he knows how to treat his future spouse and he won't have to battle that because I battled it. Some of you have to battle lust, right? Some of you have to battle addiction and you will be the first person in your family to beat alcoholism. And that way your family will not have to battle that because you already fought that. That's why this battle is so important and guess what? It's personal. Yes, it is. Because the attack that's coming against you is within you. Amen. And it was such a struggle for me to realize that he's watching me. When I'm, when I'm sitting in the home because he's spending more time in our house than he is at school. Than he is on the internet. Than he is watching anything else. He's spending more time with dad. In the setting of our living room. So what am I teaching? I've got to teach him the importance of wearing the armor. But you know, the more I thought about it, I was like, man, Paul, you just got done talking about unity. And then you go into armor. That doesn't make sense. Until you think, oh wait, that armor is more like a uniform, isn't it? And by uniform, if you have on the same uniform that I have on, we're on the same team. If we're on the same team, we have the same battle. If we have the same battle, I'm not fighting you. I'm fighting for you. And as I train him to take up the armor, as I try to share that with him, I have to remember I'm fighting for him. So students, when mom and dad say no, they're fighting for you. When mom and dad set a curfew, they're fighting for you. When they implement rules that you do not agree with, it's because someone somewhere got hurt and they want to make sure it's not you. When mom and dad give you a rule, it's because they've either seen it or done it and they don't want you to have to fight it. That's a battle that they have already tried to take care of for you so that you do not have to go through that like they did. And so with that, I'm looking at this table of armor this uniform laid out for me to accept as a dad, to accept as a parent, and it's overwhelming. Because if you're like me, you're sitting in the chair and you're thinking, well, that sounds good, Josh. But how do you get truth? How do you have a heart like that? How do you have peace in the middle of a battle? How do you get faith that can withstand shots from a distance that you did not see coming? How can you find a helmet that protects your mind? Because I have things that run through my mind all the time. And that's a very serious question. So as I'm sitting in the living room and I'm considering Lennox sitting in his chair, watching Dad, how do I give him that? How, how do I pour in this armor to him? And it hit me. The weapon. The weapon gives me the protection. It's not just an offensive tool to use against my enemy. It's an empowering tool. Because I remembered in, in the beginning, God said, let there be, and there was. He said it. The word was powerful. 
I remember that in Scripture it says no word will return void. There's, there's power there. And didn't John, John said something too. John said in verse 1 of chapter 1, he said this, and you can read it from memory. It's not going to be on the screen for you. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But listen to how he does in verse 2. He was with God in the beginning. Well, if he was with God in the beginning, what happened after that? Because it kind of sets up, right? There was a Word that was with God in the beginning. Jesus was with God in the beginning. The Word. The Word is the weapon that gives me access to the protection because the word that was in the beginning, Jesus, came down to earth for an up-close battle. And then I realized I was looking at the chairs wrong. I'm sitting here trying to fight this battle for my son, not realizing that there was a battle fought for me when I sat in this chair. That God sat in that chair a long time ago and said, you can't beat sin by yourself. Let me fight that battle for you. And so he empowered me and handed everything to this chair so that I could stand up and say, because of your word, I know truth. And the truth will set me free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. Right? I now have faith that can withstand an attack. Yeah, I've got questions. You may wonder, well, I don't know about that part where the fire fell from heaven. I just, that's fascinating to me. I just, I don't think I can agree with that. I can. Because I've seen on the news where fire hits the Southern California coast all the time with natural forest fires. What, a, what an idea. So I believe that my faith can stay strong when I have a word from God. Amen. So dads, moms, anyone who wants to be a parent, what are we teaching? What are you teaching in that environment? Not just what are we watching. But here's how I can make sure that this is a teachable moment for training to wear the same uniform. If I don't just maintain constant attacks with the Bible, but just be consistent. Consistent in how I portray it, consistent in how I teach it, so that my words line up with my actions and my son can see me wearing the armor as I teach him the armor. And when you're afraid of not having enough to be able to wear that armor, to wear that uniform, remember this, it's in a word. It's in the word that God sent for you out of love in the same way that you're doing this for your children out of love. So if you would, would you stand with me? And the band's gonna come up and they're gonna sing a song and during that song, I, I wanna ask now that if you are not family is, so that you can pray together and here's what we want you to pray about. That as a parent, embrace your child, hold their hand, put your arm around them, and say, I'm going to fight for you. And if you're a student, if you're a child, think to your parent and pray for them, saying, I'm going to fight for you. Because we're not fighting against each other, we're fighting for each other. And when you can fight for each other, a family that fights for each other stays together. God fought for you a long time ago. And this song is just a reminder of how much he loves you, that he came for an up-close battle for you. That being said, let's bow our heads and pray as the band begins to sing.